All right, sir, you're in control. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. So uh, welcome everybody who's here and who everybody who will be watching later on tonight. Um, this is uh, the second one I'm doing. I think uh, this is uh, we're going into our second or third week, I think, of what Kristen's been offering uh, these classes for. And we, today we're going to be talking about shop mobility. And um, we're going to have uh, some interesting topics on um, what processes and products we have to use for shop, shop mobility. And uh, additionally, what um, what you have to uh, um, would have to put down on the estimate uh, to back up what you're doing and stuff like that. So uh, hopefully you guys like what I put together here for you. So let's, uh, let's continue on. All right. How many times do we see damages uh, such as this on a vehicle it comes into the shop and um, we see that we have this uh, issue with, um, sorry, this issue with uh, damages uh, to the, uh, wheel and tire assembly, or even the wheel and tire might have been ripped off. Um, so we're going to have anywhere between a cut sidewall, a bubble in the side of the tire, um, a flat tire, a disabled tire it's called, wheel damage, um, suspension damage. Uh, the wheel could be set back, and especially in a situation like this where that rim is so significantly damaged. I'm not sharing my screen. Excuse me. Hang on. I don't know what happened here. Let's try this again. So Kristen just told me I'm not sharing my screen for some reason. I don't know why my screen is not being shared. Larry, does it show it being shared on your end? Yeah, it should be shared. Hang on. Screen share. Okay, I went back to screen one for some reason. I don't know why. All right, so share that. Screen two. Hey. This has never screwed up before on me, right? We haven't had this problem. Okay, so there. So I should be back, correct? Yes, sir, you are. Thank you. All right, sorry about that, guys. All right, I don't know what happened. Maybe a glitch in the system here. I know uh, Zoom's been having some issues. All right, so... Uh, to go back over this, okay, so we could have a flat tire, we could have wheel damage uh, to the rim, aluminum or steel rim, we could have damage to the suspension, a wheel setback where the wheels push rearward in, the, in its uh, setting area, or we could have a combination of damage, uh, which is probably something with this vehicle. Um, when you have a, a wheel damage, you need to take a look at it as an estimator, and I'll go off on a, a little bit of a, on topic about mobility and go into diagnostics in a way. Um, how is the rim hit? Do we have just like uh, some road rash across the side of it? Uh, is it uh, just some light scraping or cosmetic damage or even sometimes black uh, rubber transfer from another vehicle? Um, some sort of a light slow speed hit. In this particular case, you can see the rim is significantly damaged. So obviously the, the rim hit something that was stationary that didn't move. And what did move was the rim. The rim, the rim gave up. So we have an issue here where you could take into account the type of damage that was sustained by the, by the rim. In this case of the wheel assembly, the tire lost its air because the rim broke the bead. Uh, the tire could be damaged, but the tire at the bare minimum has, uh, um, has steel belt damage. So the tire has to be changed. Even if there's no puncture hole in it, uh, the rim obviously has to be changed, but look at the significant amount of damage to the rim. You would have to anticipate, that there may be some sort of suspension damage to this vehicle. So this is something that you really need to take a look at. Um, driving the vehicle inside the shop or around your yard would be very difficult with this type of wheel because you could do damage to the um, rocker molding, the bottom side of the bumper cover. Um, you could lose control and hit something else. So you wanna be very careful of that. So what do we do in this particular case? Um, we can do one of two things. One is we can uh, use the customer spare tire, which I'm not a big fan of. Number one, most of the European cars aren't coming with spare tires anymore. That's uh, a thing they've done away with kind of. Uh, they're not utilizing those anymore uh, for vehicle weight and, and space savings. And uh, 
who wants to dirty up somebody's nice spare tire? Plus, once you use a spare tire, you're not supposed to reuse it. So if you break down with a, a, a vehicle someplace and you go ahead and you put your spare tire on and you drive more than five or 10 miles, you're supposed to change that wheel. You're supposed to go back and purchase another, another spare tire. That's why they're not that expensive. Um, now, you might have a few of these laying around the shop, these spare tires, but to get the right tire to fit on the right rim, uh, uh, excuse me, the right hub assembly could be a little bit of an issue. So your tech might waste some time looking for that unless you mark off what each wheel is. So you have a couple of different choices there. Or uh, Kristen uh, a while back did uh, uh, this gunny wheel video and basically this wheel, um, there's a few different size wheels, one basically for cars, one for SUVs. And there's a bolt pattern on there that basically fits multiple different uh, uh, vehicle uh, bolt patterns so that uh, you can use these on almost any vehicle uh, that you want. And you should have a few of them in my opinion. Uh, then they're uh, reusable, uh, but you have to keep in mind that you're only allowed to go less than five miles per hour. So this is not something you take on a test drive. This is not something that, you know, you spin around in the backyard at the shop. Uh, you don't want to do anything like that. Uh, and you have to keep in mind that when you talk these wheels, they tell you don't talk these wheels to more than 50 foot pounds. And the reason why is you don't want to bend the rim uh, sitting. You don't want to cause any damages to anything. And 50, 50 pound feet is good enough to hold the rim on its position on the vehicle because you're not going anything more than three to five miles per hour. And it does have these little speed bumps. If you look at Kristen's hand to the left-hand side of it, you'll see a little little bump on the tire. If you look around the tire, you'll see that there's little bumps all the way around. And that's to cause the vehicle to kind of shake very badly if you actually try to drive it fast. So uh, that's, that's one good safety feature built into these uh, particular wheels. Now keep in mind that um, any spare tire or, or, or customer spare tire that you utilize or even if you use the gunny wheel or I don't know if there's another product out there that's like this um, there's a labor charge for that and there's a difference in, in labor on that so we're gonna cover now uh, some of the stuff we see it um, in, in, in the, the actual P pages here so uh, if we take a look here at um, the Mitchell guide excuse me the um, motors guide uh, this is CCC uh, motors and we looked on page uh, G14 and there's a, a road wheel R&R &R. and so I blew up the picture for you and it says here that uh, special notation when required an additional 0.3 hours may be necessary to remove a spare tire from its location and install it on the hub and later to remove the spare tire from the hub and reinstall it to the original location. Now this is when a vehicle is immobile, uh, has a disabled tire or disabled tire and rim assembly on it and you have to put a spare on it. So um, keep in mind that um, this, particular uh, this particular database provider actually calls this out for you. <clears throat> now on um, Mitchell system, which is online, so I don't have a page, but it's under the procedures and under wheel and tire. They also have a, a little notation here on their wheel and tire, what's included, what's not. And I blew it up for you. It says labor times with part numbers shown in the text are for remove and install of the wheel and tire assembly. When necessary to R&I a damaged wheel and tire assembly for repair or sublet and substitute with the vehicle's existing spare, a tire, for temporary mobility, an additional 0.2 hours is provided in the wheel section head notes. So here's two OEMs that actually tell you, boom, here's uh, some information on our tires. Now, Autotex has, um, has not a statement on it. And uh, um, that's an unfortunate situation here, but under the, um, <clears throat> Under uh, the DEG, uh, 15832 is the tracking number. Um, they have here where somebody had put in that um, an insurance carrier using Autotech says labor for wheel replacement is included in mountain balance. They also claim labor to R&R &R the wheel is included, even if there is no other options for being performed in the area of the wheel to be removed or placed. 
such as a fender line or R and I. They are unable to provide documentation to support their position. Repair facility is using CCC labor to remove replace wheels as separate uh, operation from balance and cost of uh, weights as per P pages. Mounting tires and wheel balancing cannot be performed with wheels attached to the vehicle. They must be removed through its procedure. Suggestion, Autotax should show the same labor as CCC, 3.3 uh, uh, mechanical to replace a spare wheel with the wheel uh, balancing as a separate operation. Tire transfer or replacement and wheel balance cannot be performed with the wheels attached to the vehicle. The wheels do not remove and install themselves from the vehicle must be labor applied. So the inquiry resolution says, thank you for your inquiry. When a user selects an operation to be done using sublet dollar amount, the end user sublet vendor providing the price would come up with their own set of included, not included operations using 4.3 included non included operations and 4.2 labor exclusions is based on the end user selecting database items utilizing database labor not being modified into a sublet value. So when R and I of one wheel is selected, labor is 0.1. When R and R of the wheel is selected, uh, labor is 0.4, which includes the raised support vehicle, remove the wheel and tire assembly, and transfer tire from um, one wheel to another and R and I, the TPMS sensor, install valve stem, load the vehicle and talk down to OEM spec. Now keep in mind, the talk to OEM spec is included in all three database providers. But if you read the repair manual on installing wheels, you have to talk the wheels after you're done. Then you have to test drive the vehicle from anywhere from uh, uh, five miles all the way up to 300 miles and then re talk or recheck the torque on the wheels. So the re talking after the test drive or after that uh, uh, particular amount of time is not an included operation as opposed to the installing of the wheel and torquing it. Now, also, it says he had not included in this top red box here, the last little paragraph says not included items would be R and I of the spare wheel to use in place of the original wheel to keep the vehicle moving during repairs, cost of the tire balancing, disposal fees, cost of TPMS sensor rebuilder kit, uh, cost of valve stems, cost of wheel weights, reset TPMS, relearn, road testing, labor to look up OEM repair information, look up talk spec, cost of subscription to access OEM repair information. So. Autotech says it's not included to put the spare tire on there for mobility, but they're not giving you any suggested time whatsoever. So with that said, let's look at some facts here, all right? Let's, let's take into account some information we already have here. And uh, remember, you guys are gonna get a copy of this, so keep that in mind. So what we have going on here is we're gonna use an average of 0.2 to install a spare tire on a vehicle for mobility only, all right? This is where we have like that first picture I showed of that Porsche that had the, uh, the damaged front wheel and, um, well, Ben's, I forget the picture what it is. I forget which one I used. Um, where the rim was damaged and significantly bent. So we have to take that off and put a spare tire on there. So we're gonna use the, the average of 0.2. Uh, Mitchell says 0.3. Autotex says nothing, but it's not included, and CCC says 0.2. So I'm gonna take the lower 0.2 to show you guys an example of something. So to get the spare tire out of the car, we're gonna to have to remove the spare tire cover mat or retrieve the universal spare uh, tire. So let's put down 0.1 for that. So if we use $50 an hour labor rate, just so that nobody screams or yells, I'm not telling you what labor rate to use, but I gotta use something. So we're gonna use 50 bucks. So if we take the 0.3 labor time and we times that by $50, we wind up with 15 bucks. No big deal, right? Who cares about that? Well, how many times a week do you think that you have to go ahead and change a wheel or hold the wheel onto a tire or do anything such as that. So, you know, think about this in, in terms of being a business. You know, how many times are you going to do the same procedure over and over again? So let's say you do this five times a week. If you do this five times a week, all right, so five times the 15 is going to be $75. Now that $75 is 
maybe not a lot of money to a lot of people. I mean, you know, think about it. It's still no big deal, but it's your money. And that's, you want to do it for free. That's completely up to you. You can do it for free. You can do whatever you want. That's not my business. I'm just showing you what, what the facts are. So, you know, yeah, you have $75 a week. That's five five different vehicles you're doing this on. It could be four tires on one vehicle and one tire on another vehicle. So it could just be two vehicles that you have. I don't know. Maybe the wheels are stolen. I'm up in New York City, um, Long Island area, Nassau County, and wheels get stolen off cars all the time. Uh, and vehicles are left on top of uh, milk crates and, and cinder blocks. So still no big deal. Well, let's take a look at uh, this. We have uh, five jobs per week, right? We said that's the five from the $75. So the five jobs per week times 52 weeks is 260 jobs a year. Well, does anyone know how much money that is at the end of the year? $3,900 because we take the 260 jobs because we're doing five jobs a week on this. 260 jobs at $15 is 3900 annually. And that's just on one procedure, guys. One procedure. By the end of this program and by the end of the last program that we offered and even next, next week's um, program, we're going to take a look at how much money actually lost on these three different programs I actually uh, am showing you uh, on procedures you're doing for free. Uh, uh, you can collect on them if you want. If you don't want to collect on them, hey, you know, nothing I could say about that. But let's look at some other procedures or other stuff we have to do on the vehicles. And, and keep in mind that this is for your own protection in some cases, um, your own liability protection. So vehicle safety during repairs. Well, first off, you have to research the OEM repair manual. I don't care if it's a key scratch in the top of the hood that uh, someone's uh, son or daughter made uh, during the winter or the summer when they were trying to clean the car off and they took a, a, a shovel or, or a rake to try and clean leaves or a shovel to take, uh, uh, take snow off the car and scratch the hood. Car wasn't in a collision, probably didn't set any codes, didn't cause any structural damage. All right. You're sanding and painting the hood, but you still have to read the OM repair information that's pertaining to doing any repairs to the hood or any type of disabling of the battery or anything else like that. Additionally, you're going to have to pre-measure the car and you're going to have to pre-repair, uh, scan the vehicle. Why? Because we don't know what pre-existing conditions might be on the vehicle. And in two weeks from now, when I talk about um, emblem replacement, and I stuck in an emblem replacement just for a particular reason, uh, an emblem replacement, I'm going to actually talk about a vehicle that came into a shop that actually had structural damage and it was there for a nonsensical reason and there's significant structural damage. And if the shop didn't listen and didn't go ahead and pre-measure this car, they would be on the hook or liable for any of the damages that were on that vehicle because they're the last professional to touch it. So imagine fixing a hood for scratches and then you find out, <clears throat> I don't know, the airbags didn't deploy. Um, there was significant collision damage to the front of the vehicle that you never noticed because you decided, well, it's only scratches to the hood. I don't have to be worried about anything else. And, and in a way, maybe somebody never really opened the hood. They popped the hood up. They put you know, masking tape around the edges, sanded the hood, prepped it, primed it, and painted the hood. Or well, they just took it off the car and painted the hood by itself and then put it back on the car, buffed it out, and said, okay, it's good to go. This is why it's imperative that you read the OEM repair manual. Most of the repair manuals and most of the repairs to a vehicle that uh, are written in the, the, the repair information from the manufacturer, the protocols, it tells you numerous times in the first few pages, maybe the first five to 10 pages, you have to disconnect the battery. And you have to disconnect the battery and reconnect it when you want to move the vehicle. And you have to make sure that you do uh, tighten the battery cable. You can't have a battery cable loose because of all the computers in the car. You don't want to have a spike in the system uh, because the battery cable's loose and the, the alternator had to generate more power. And this is even more important when you have something like, let's say, a hybrid vehicle. You're going to have multiple DNRs of that battery uh, cable. 
uh, on and off. Uh, sometimes it's one cable, sometimes it's two cables. Some manufacturers require you to take both cables off, wait, a, wait 30 seconds, and then cross or connect the two cables together to discharge the system out. Once again, you have to read the manufacturer's repair information. Some companies, such as Audi, Volkswagen, Porsche, require that the ignition rem remain on. So you get in the car, you have to push the button and leave the ignition on in the on position or turn the key to the on position to just disconnect the battery. Additionally, some of the Audi models require a factory scanning computer to actually shut the vehicle down prior to disconnecting the vehicle. Otherwise, a lot of memory stuff could be lost in there or reprogramming will have to occur. Before you disconnect the battery, you should write down the customer's radio presets. So you want to go ahead and go through each one of their uh, radio stations, XM Sirius, uh, AM, FM, any type of radio uh, presets that they have, maybe for CB or whatever. Uh, you want to make sure that you put all those codes down, all those locations, so that you can make sure that when you go ahead and you uh, rehook up the battery, if the codes didn't stay in some sort of memory place, well, then you can put them back in there uh, so that the car is back to its pre-loss condition. Another thing you want to check out by reading the owner's manual, excuse me, uh, the OEM repair manual, not the owner's manual, the repair manual, or even the owner's manual you, you could reference, is there a radio security code that locks the radio? Nothing worse than getting the car, giving it back to the customer. The customer says, well, my radio doesn't work. And then you ask them what the radio code is, and they don't have a clue. It's probably at home in their paperwork, in their lease or, or, or uh, purchase uh, paperwork, and they have no clue where it's at. So it's important that you make sure that you have the, you know, know if there's a radio code. So when you first get the car in for repairs, if there is, you can call the dealer and find out how to get that code or how to get the, you know, uh, obtain the code or figure out what the code is uh, prior to giving the car back to the customer. Just probably a little bit smart way of doing business there. So vehicle safety for repairs and mobility uh, following the uh, OEM repair procedures and protocols. Is an OEM uh, computer or, or scanning type uh, computer required to shut the vehicle down? Write down all the radio presets that are in the vehicle. You're going to DNR the battery, and at bare minimum, you're going to isolate the, um, that says batter, it should say battery, excuse me about that, I missed the Y. Uh, the battery cable, the negative battery cable should be isolated. Uh, you want to use some sort of electrical or, or, or uh, electric uh, preventing type tape that goes around it. I wouldn't use a plastic bag or anything. I would rather use uh, some sort of uh, duct tape that's for electrical usage or, or regular um, electrical tape on that. And when you do connect the vehicle all back together, make sure that you check all the connections prior to releasing the car to the, uh, to, to the customer. Uh, keep in mind that that, that test drive and, and uh, pre uh, pre-engine startup test will ensure that everything's working. And then obviously your post repair scan will also make sure everything's working. Uh, might be a good idea also to write down which uh, wires besides the battery cable you did disconnect. Uh, sometimes when there's an issue or problem with a system not running properly, let's say you had for some reason you had to disconnect um, the ECM, the electronic control module, the engine control module, and you had to disconnect um, both battery cables. Well, now you have a situation where you put the car back together and something with the engine maintenance uh, isn't isn't right. So you have an engine check engine light comes on. Well, maybe one of those little prongs were bent when you when you put the wire harness together, or maybe it isn't securely down. Some of the BMW uh, Porsche Audi, the European cars have like this snap down holder that locks into place. Similar to even Chrysler has that similar type one. Uh, GM usually has a plug in type um, uh, that snaps in and then usually it's like a little lock piece that goes in there. Funny enough, sometimes if you don't put that lock piece in there. It doesn't force uh, the lock into place and it doesn't lock properly. And so you have a little bit of a connection to start the car, but it's not running properly because it doesn't have the right resistance going through it. So keep that in mind. Uh, make sure you write down what connections you did disassemble so that if you do have a problem, you could always check it by making sure that um, you know which systems you did disconnect so you're not disconnecting things you shouldn't be. 
Uh, this uh, I'm going to bring into here because we're talking about disconnecting the vehicle and the mobility of it. You will never, ever, 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 ever. I don't know how many times I have to say the word never, ever, but never, ever supposed to use memory savers, surge protectors. Never. Never use them. There's no procedure that calls for them. Uh, a nine volt battery can deploy airbags. It has enough energy left in it to deploy uh, airbags. Um, surge protectors will still allow electrical current to run through the vehicle and you can fry computer components. You can melt uh, um, wire harnesses. You can cause arcing between wire harnesses while welding. So the battery has to be disconnected. There's no OEM repair information anywhere from any one of the manufacturers that tell you, use a surge protector or memory saver. These things should never be utilized in, in, in any type of situation whatsoever. Now for hybrids, once again, talking about uh, um, OEM repair procedures. Once again, you have to read the OEM repair procedures at, at all times. And they always tell you to disconnect uh, the 12 volt battery. Well, in the case of the hybrids, it's very important to read and understand these vehicles or even electric vehicles that you also have to disable or disconnect certain things on the, um, on the hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles in the case of, let's say like a Tesla. So 95% uh, of these companies, 98% of the companies that have hybrids will have one or more of these procedures, okay, that are gonna be required. Almost all of them, to my knowledge right now, require at least a 12 volt and something of the high voltage system to be disconnected. So, you know, the 12 volt battery, and they're usually gonna require you to uh, uh, disable the high voltage batteries by doing some sort of uh, pulling out of a plug. Uh, they're going to record, they all require you to put some sort of special warning labels, usually in their um, repair information, uh, in their owner's manual, and in the fire department um, or first responder safety guide that actually give you little signs that actually say warning hybrid vehicle uh, disabled. And um, you'll put those on the car. My suggestion is print them out in orange with black lettering and they seem to stick out pretty well. I would use some sort of neon orange so people recognize them. Um, make sure you do read the repair information on how to disable these vehicles. Now, they're all going to call for you to wear high voltage gloves. Now, I've had people say to me, well, Larry, that orange plug or that orange uh, uh, breaker type plug, a uh, light switch, it's all plastic. It's a, it, it, there's nothing electrical there. Well, you got two choices. You can buy the gloves, which are about 150 bucks, um, or you could not buy them. If you wear the gloves, probably nothing's going to happen to you. If you don't wear the gloves, you could wind up killing yourself or significantly injuring yourself to the point that you're like basically a vegetable. So for $149 to wear gloves, I really don't know why you wouldn't go ahead and select to go ahead and uh, wear these gloves. I, I don't know what the issue is, why you would go ahead and, uh, and not purchase these gloves and utilize the gloves. Now, when you use the gloves, you're supposed to pull out this, in this picture here, this is the orange plug, similar to what you see on some of the GMs and also on the um, Toyota Lexus Scion type vehicles. Um, some other ones look like a circuit breaker. You got to remove a metal plate and then there's a circuit breaker switch in there, kind of like you see in your fuse box uh, in, your, in your shop. Um, the vehicle will be immobile once you do this. That, that means everything will be immobile on this vehicle. So you're going to have to either use dollies on the wheels, um, like Gojacks, or you're going to, have to take the wheels off and you're going to have to install dollies that bolt directly to the, um, to the wheel hub. Now, keep in mind something like, let's say, uh, Mercedes-Benz or, or Porsche uh, that have these hybrid vehicles. Uh, they're going to require you to disable the vehicle, but they want it brought to the dealer. So you're going to have to tow the car to the dealer. They're going to disable it. Once they disable it, well, you can't put it in neutral. So you have to put it in, uh, um, you're going to have to put it on uh, Gojax or something like that and then push it around the shop, which could be a real pain um, to push it around the shop to get it across either concrete or gravel or uneven type concrete inside the shop. Or some of you guys have seen uh, one of my clients, Mid-Island, they have those tile floors which are a nightmare to push cars across, especially even on like the big select benches that they have. So um, you have to plan this out properly beforehand.
So disabled hybrid electric vehicles, because these vehicles are locked in, in a position, you can't keep reconnecting the battery and disconnecting it. Um, they got to be pushed around on dollies. And the reason you have to push around hybrid vehicles on a dolly, if you push it on its own, where you leave, let's say, oh, I'm going to leave it in neutral and use the emergency brake or chalk the wheels. The problem is, is as you push the vehicle, you're regenerating braking with that. Okay. And what you're doing is you're actually creating electrical current to be built up inside um, the capacitors. And if someone accidentally touches one of those orange wire connectors someplace, you could get shocked and hurt badly or killed. So you're supposed to push them around on Gojacks. All right. So this is the importance of reading the repair information from the manufacturer so you know exactly what's going on with this. So um, I'm sure uh, eventually Kristen and I and Jason will be putting together a, uh, I guess you would say, um, a newer hybrid uh, uh, class or a hybrid awareness type class that we'll have out about something. Mechanical components. Well, when a vehicle is involved in a collision, especially a frontal collision, if the engine's in the front, there's a few cars that have mid engines or rear engines on them, such as the Porsche um, that has stuff in the front of the car and the engine in the back. So now we have an issue where we have a wide range of stuff we have to do. So let's talk in, uh, if we have a vehicle that's uh, impacted in the front, sustained damage to the lower front rail, and we're going to have to change at least one lower front rail. Well, we have the air conditioning, we have the coolant system, we have uh, oil coolers, uh, transmission coolers, or power steering coolers, or all three of those type coolers. We also have, in some cases, intercoolers. We also have uh, air ducts for um, the air filter inlet so that the vehicle can breathe properly. So what do we do with this? Well, we have to seal the AC lines. Generally, the best way to seal AC lines are, are water balloons because um, they're, they're usually for children. They're non-toxic or they don't have any powder on them. So uh, water balloons work great. Um, with the coolant lines, because you might start a non-hybrid vehicle to drive it around the shop if the engine is still in the car, uh, you're either going to seal or loop the uh, coolant lines. This is so you don't have coolant dripping all over the floor. So you can either seal them or you could loop the lines where you connect the upper and lower hose by using another hose so that if you do start the car, you don't have uh, 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 coolant uh, blowing all over the floor. Uh, oil lines. Uh, if you have an oil cooler on it, you're going to have to seal and loop those oil lines. If you have transmission lines, obviously you're going to have to seal and loop those lines also if it's equipped with that. Uh, sometimes you have a power steering cooler, so you're gonna have to loop those lines also. Now, when you, uh, let's say you're doing a ride support on a car or a lower rail, a lot of times you have to take the air filter box out. Well, if you're taking that air inlet air filter box out, I see a lot of shops do this. They leave that snorkel or nozzle that's attached to, um, the intake of the vehicle and they leave that open and that's collecting all that dust uh, dirt and grime flying around inside the shop. And that's going to get directly inside the motor with no filtration whatsoever. So you might want to go ahead and, and put a rubber band with uh, some sort of filter across the front of that. You can't put anything too thick because then the car is going to suffocate if you start it. So you should put something over the front of it. So don't put plastic, put something breathable. Um, even have a, an, a, an old filter that you can uh, flatten out instead of that corrugated way it is, flatten it out and put it around uh, the front area there and kind of put a rubber band around it to make sure that the, the vehicle can still breathe. Um, or a couple of pieces of uh, uh, non-lint type uh, cloth uh, uh, rags or something so that uh, the vehicle can still breathe, but it doesn't allow dust or dirt in there. Uh, your draining of the fluids, um, you have to get rid of your fluids, which obviously is gonna be a hazardous uh, uh, mat disposal type thing on there. And just keep thinking about all the procedures I'm bringing up here and what you actually have to do to this vehicle. Well, we don't even know what's wrong with it. We're just giving you some different examples of stuff you have to do. Now, let's say we're changing the lower frame rail on a vehicle. Well, now we have a situation where we have, um, the engine has to come out. Well, now how do we move this car with no suspension drivetrain in it? 
Well, we dropped the whole drivetrain down with the engine, transmission, uh, front suspension components on it, and we dropped this out. Now we have a, a nice wide open area that we can uh, uh, change our lower rail on, our uh, upper rail and apron assembly or any combinations of those, and we're going to have the issue where we're going to have to paint that stuff. Well, how do we get it on the frame machine, off the frame machine, and move it around the shop during this whole process? So what do we do? Well, this dolly system here works out pretty well where it attaches right to the pinch weld clamps and you're able to push the vehicle around. Now, keep in mind that your safest way is at least three techs, uh, one in the back, two in the front, okay? The two in the front will control left and right and the guy in the back will just push along. Um, when you get it to the bench, if you have a drive up bench, uh, you might have to go ahead and winch it up on the bench, which is going to be a, a, a precarious situation unless you do it very carefully. And I'd even say if you have to do that, those wheels on there might have to be changed for larger diameter uh, uh, caster wheels so that uh, it's a little bit safer pulling it up on the on the bench that way. You have to do it very slowly with you know guys on each side of the uh, car as it pulls up. Uh, up the bench on each side of the car as you pull it up there. If you have... Um, uh, a roll around type bench like a select bench well then basically uh you can just put this car up on the lift and then you know uh, take that dolly off and then go ahead and drop it down on top of the bench uh if you have a, a car line system that's buried in the ground well then you can push the car over the top of it and then raise the machine up to go ahead and um mount the car on top of the machine but once again if you have a drive up you're probably going to need some winching and just pushing it around the shop you're probably going to need three techs um minimum to make sure that nothing happens. I don't suggest using a jack or anything like that because as we all know, jacks will twist and bend and they're not made for that type of thing uh, to, to use some sort of jack with that. Supplementary restraint systems. Uh, well, the supplemental restraint systems require a wide range of different ways to disable the system. Uh, disabling the system can range anywhere from just uh, Disconnecting the battery, uh, waiting a few minutes, um, pulling a fuse. Some require you to actually disconnect the uh, airbag control module, the ACM. Uh, that's usually in the center console, either in the front, the back, or the middle of it. Um, some GMs, it's underneath the uh, driver's seat, uh, which may require you to RNI the console. Uh, usually you don't have to take the seat out just to unplug it, but you would have to take the seat out to lift up the carpet to actually uh, remove the, uh, the assembly. Sometimes with the console, you can reach in front of it and just unplug it. Sometimes you can pop out like the cup holder or um, take out the um, interior portion of the center console storage area and just reach the unit to unplug it for like testing purposes, but to actually remove the entire unit, you have to take the console out. So once again, reading the repair information will let you know, one, if you're just disconnecting the battery, if you have to disconnect the battery and disconnect the, uh, pull out one of the fuses, or if you have to disconnect the battery, pull a fuse and uh, pull out the wires to the uh, airbag control module itself. So keep that in mind. Keep in mind that um, you'll have to disconnect and reconnect any sensors in the area of damage and uh, connect uh, sensors that are in the area of damage, most manufacturers require you to replace them for safety purposes. Keep in mind, this is also true with um, pressure sensors and doors where you have damage to a door and you have a pressure sensor inside the door uh, assembly, the door, door module itself. So we have here as an example, we have a 2018 Chevy Impala so, uh, so uh, supplemental inflatable restraints, that's what the SIR stands for, service precautions. When performing service on a near SIR components or the SIR wiring, the SIR system must be disabled. Failure to observe correct procedure could cause the deployment of SRI components. Serious injury can occur. Failure to observe the correct procedure could also result in unnecessary SIR uh, repairs. So let's say you decided that you don't need to read the procedures. I don't need to re read them at all. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this 30 years. I don't know why 30 years seems to be the main sticking point with everybody, but everybody, everybody's been a professional for 30 years. Now, um, your technician decides he's going to work on this, and uh, the customer comes back with a complaint that uh, the door doesn't open and close um, smoothly. You put a new door on it and a B pillar, let's say. Well, 
your tech's going to go out there with a Torx head, uh, probably a, a TX50, and he's going to go out there and try and loosen up that uh, 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 striker bolt, and then he's going to tap it with a hammer up and down to line the door up because that's what he thinks is the problem. And uh, because the customer has it outside, the customer has the car run, and he drives, he says, ah, don't worry about it, just get out of the car. The customer gets out of the car, he starts tapping on this while the car's running. And then all of a sudden, he says, okay, the door opens and closes. Great. As he opens and closes a few times, he hits that striker with a hammer up and down. Car's still running. Well, he's all done. He tells the customer, okay, go ahead. You're all done. Take off. And the customer gets in the car, gets ready to take off. And he calls you, hey, uh, Joe, Joe, technician, come here. Come back here for a second. He goes, what's up? He goes, uh, my seatbelt's not working. What do you mean? Say? And the tech goes to pull in the seatbelt, and the seatbelt's locked up. Well, the car was running. You started beating the hell out of that, that strike and move it up and down and, uh, you know, shift the position of it. You open and close the door, you know, like crazy while the car's running there. You slam it open and close it and stuff like that. And something set off the, you know, the pyrotechnic device inside the, the seatbelt and locked it up. And that's a fact. I, I, I have three different cases where we were involved in that. And uh, we had to go look at them and stuff. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, keep in mind that you don't want that happening. Or you decide that you're going to leave the ignition in the on position and you're changing the airbags and you're changing the airbag control module, but you're going to leave the ignition on because you've got to move the seats forward and back as you try and put in, the, um, put in your uh, um, airbag control module. Well, as you're doing this, you're moving the seats back and forth. The, the, the car's on. You have the radio on because you want to listen to it and keep it entertained. And you plug the AC, uh, 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 the airbag control unit in, the ACM. You plug it, and you go to put it on top of the, um, the mounting point because usually there's a couple of studs there. And um, as you go to mount it, you don't get it on all the way, and you drop your ratchet. You go to pick up your ratchet. As you go to pick up your ratchet, you let go of the module. The module falls off the you know, the hump kind of slides off a little bit. Well, what do you think the car's going to think? The car's on. The module goes ahead and does one of these things. Well, guess what? It might think that it's in a rollover and deploy the airbags. Oops. So according to uh, cry, uh, excuse me, GM or Chevrolet here, turn the steering wheel so that the vehicle wheels are pointed in straight-ahead position. Place the ignition in the off position. Warning, the sensing diagnostic module, that's the airbag control module, may have more than one fuse power input. To ensure there is no unwanted SIR deployment, personal injury, or unnecessary SIR repairs, remove all fuses supplying power to the SDM. With all uh, the, uh, SDM fuses removed, the ignition switch in the on position, the airbag warning light indicates, indicator illuminates, that's your malfunction indicator lamp. This is normal operation. Does not indicate indicate an SIR system malfunction. Locate and remove, remove the fuses supplying power to the inflatable restraint sensing and diagnostic module. Refer to the SIR schematics or master electrical component list. Well, if you're in all data, the newer all data will actually give you links to this. And you, if you're in the OEM repair information, it'll also give you links to this. And then it tells you wait two minutes for the system to run out of power or dissipate all its power before working on the SIR system or working on the vehicle. So once again, it, you have to read the procedures. Here's a Nissan Altima sensing and diagnostic unit, removal and installation, removal and installation, warning. Before servicing the SRS, place the ignition switch in the off position. Disconnect both battery cables, then wait at least three minutes. Before disconnecting the airbag uh, diagnostic sensing unit, harness connectors. Be sure to disconnect the harness connector of each of the airbag modules, seatbelt pretensioners, and lap pretensioners to prevent accidental airbag deployment by static electricity and seatbelt pretensioner operation. So this means before you go ahead and disconnect the main control brain, they want you to unplug all the other wires first. Do not use air tools or electric tools for service in the airbag diagnostic unit. Mean Stop put, put it in with a ra hand ratchet. Do not use electric or, or, or air tools that will crank down on these bolts. When replacing the airbag uh, diagnostic sensing unit, always check with the parts department for the latest parts information. Installing an incorrect airbag diagnostic unit may or may not cause the airbag warning lamp to illuminate, may cause incorrect deployment of the supplemental air, 
airbags and seatbelt pretensions in a co uh, collision resulting in serious personal injury or death. So once again, read the repair information from the manufacturer. They, 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 they have engineers that write this stuff up and go through it to prevent issues from happening. And once again, you don't want to be the guy or the girl that went ahead and didn't read the procedures and didn't look them up because you've been doing it for 30 years and then something deploys on you. It'd be a very, very scary situation. So the damage report. I don't like to call them estimates. I call them damage reports. So the damage report here, as we look at it, now, <clears throat> this is not going to be on, and I wrote it at the top of this estimate here, this is only showing how operations would be written on a damage report. All operations would not show up on the same damage report. So I'm giving you a couple of uh, highlights here of how you would put it on a damage report. Instead of me just hand typing them out, I put them in an estimate so you could see what they look like. So. Uh, um, in this case, uh, repair information, uh, look it up. Uh, we'll have a service fee for that uh, uh, from the OEM uh, website, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a labor time for doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm infamous for, for splitting everything up into different departments. Uh, uh, so vehicle diagnostics uh, or anything like that, anything that requires you looking up information or reading information, I'll have it's diagnostic or D instead of mechanical. Um, same thing with a pre-scan and a post-scan. I don't have it under mechanical. I have, a, have it under diagnostic, although I'll keep the labor rates probably exactly the same. Uh, frame damage. Uh, well, we don't know if it has frame damage or not, but we're going to have here, uh, if we had frame structure, we'll have to install the vehicle on a dolly and winch the vehicle onto the frame bench. Uh, once again, uh, time includes additional technicians in there for you know, pushing the vehicle around or, or, or the technicians being next to it. Now, you might have to move the vehicle more than one or, one or two times throughout your shop or you have a very large shop uh, or shops across the street from each other. Uh, now you get into a situation here which you might actually, actually have to have a tow on there. Um, now, once again, remember I told you you have to pre-measure the car, so I didn't put that on here because I'm trying to go over stuff that you didn't know about already that's supposed to be on every estimate. So every estimate, you got to look up the repair information. You got to pre-scan. You have to uh, 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 post-repair scan uh, or pre, uh, I guess, pre-calibrate scan and then a post-calibration scan uh, and also pre-measure the vehicle. So that's not on here. If you've seen my other C20 group uh, type meetings, I've already talked about that. That's why those aren't included here. Cooling. Um, we disconnect the hose clamps. So we've got to replace the hose clamps. Uh, loop the coolant lines. Uh, banjo hose clamps, um, those aftermarket type uh, banjo clamps just for the time being on the coolant lines. Uh, seal cooler lines. Uh, seal intercooler lines. Seal transmission cooler lines. So you got the oil, you got the intercooler, you got the transmission. Um, power steering if it's available. Seal the AC lines. Um, seal and protect the air cleaner assembly. Uh, on the battery, I put a note, Tom is to disconnect the battery multiple times for repairs. Isolate the battery cables. DNR the hybrid battery. Um, however, system that requires to be done. Hybrid disable signs to be hung on the vehicle. SRS or hybrid fuses that have to be pulled out. Tie up and secure wire harness and cover plugs. You can't leave the plugs on wire harnesses that are attached to the vehicle when let's say you pull out that motor like I showed on that other car with the, um, the engine out of it. You can't go ahead and, and have um, the wire harnesses hanging, slapping around, uh, and you can't have the ends open. You have to make sure you do cover them and seal them up. You don't want moisture, dirt, oils, anything getting in there, okay? And when you go to reassemble it, check with the manufacturer, usually a little dielectric across the front of it. That's a, a clear-looking Vaseline-type grease that helps with conductivity and also helps seal up the area, uh, should be utilized. Um, reset the radio presets uh, and the phone. You got to make the phone connection because most customers don't know how to put their phones or hook their phones up to the car. Uh, reset the express features and the memories to the vehicle. Uh, the airbag system diagnosis, uh, diagnostic unit, that's to unplug it. Uh, labor time is after the center console is removed. And in case here, we got the RNI, the center console. Now, the first line of this next page here, um, 
it's just the note for the console, uh, uh, RNI console to DNR SRS ACM. So disconnect and reconnect the supplemental restraint system airbag control module. Now, let me show you this little color coordinated thing I have here. All the green go together, the red go together, and the blue go together. So as we look at the green, if we're going to RNI the tires, to install line 42, install the wheel dollies for a hybrid, well, then this is kind of like the way you would do it, okay? If I have damage to that left front wheel, like I first showed you when this program started, I would do the R and I of the left front wheel, which is red, and then I would install the red, the spare tire. Now, you could also install the next line down, which is the gunny wheel, if you wanted to install that but I have four of them being installed there. So you install a spare wheel or you install the gunny wheel by itself. So that's the reds. The blues now are there's damage to the left front wheel and I'm installing the, uh, uh, the gunny wheel on there. So that's the other option that I gave you that. So the, the, the red and the blue are similar to each other on that. Um, the next line down there is move hybrid vehicle uh, from department to department, I put 1.5. Number three for me is non-certified operations, meaning um, almost anyone can wash a car or, or, or push a car around a shop. It, it's not a lot of skill involved in that. So that's usually at my lower labor rate when I have labor rates split up. But once again, these labor rates are lower at 50 bucks. So whatever you decide to do is your own uh, shop's decision here. Um, the rear body and floor, if I am uh, using the the customer spare tire, uh, there is a point one or point two to uh, remove the floor mat or the covering back there. Um, I'd make an argument on some of these European cars. You got four or five pieces of foam that you got to take out before you ever even get to the spare tire if they do have one. And then, of course, miscellaneous operations in the case of this. Degrease and clean the vehicle for repair and analysis. And then, of course, your sublet for your hazardous work waste just for fluids. Because once again, you're going to have three, maybe four different um, hazardous waste cleanups. You're going to have your uh, cardboard, paper, plastic, or paper and plastic are going to be separate. You're going to have your uh, um, solvents, you know, from painting. You're going to have your uh, solids from painting, which may or may not be hazardous waste. And then you're going to have fluids from the vehicle. And the fluids from the vehicle, a guy might come with one truck, but he collects all the different materials separately, the oil, the, the transmission, excuse me, the, the oil transmission and power steering fluid are usually all in one big waste jug, but your antifreeze has to be in a different waste jug. So once again, you're going to have a couple of different situations here and a couple of different ways that you have to keep your materials separated from each other. And I don't know how to stress this. You can have uh, solvent-based paint waste that's not hardened or it doesn't have enough hardener in it. So it's still somewhat of a liquid with a little bit of hardening to it and water borne uh, um, uh, uh, waste material in the same area and have any type of electrical current because they'll be building the Memorial baseball park where your, where your shop once stood. So keep that in mind. So on the damage report, once again, you're not going to see all these operations. And I didn't want to show four or five different versions of the estimate, but primarily based on a, a, a frontal hit on a, a, on a regular vehicle, these operations might be about 750 bucks. On a hybrid vehicle with the same type of front rail damage and the engine has to come out and all this other stuff, you're looking at just these procedures here that would be attributed to uh, um, the hybrid repair would be about 900 bucks. So give or take anywhere between 750 to 900 that some of you guys might be doing for free on every single car because we either didn't know, we're too lazy to read it, or we don't want to read the repair information, or no one really showed us. And, and that could be the issue there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring uh, uh, Kristen back in here. And uh, if Jason's around, Jason can come back in here too. We're going to bring up some questions and answers now. If anyone has any uh Statements, questions, anything they want to bring up, we're here to try and help you guys out and answer these. Yeah, I'm just going through here real quick, Larry, and reading on a few, just a few notes for what you at what you what you covered um, that I kind of wanted to add. Um, for an estimator, I always it's a really cool exercise. And now that you have some time, and we know that things are slowing a little bit, and so there's always things we want to do that we never get a chance to do because we don't have the time. But now that we have that time. 
Um, I, I'd really like you to do an exercise where you walk out in the back. Let's take one of these cars that have been dropped off to you, towed in, et cetera. Walk back there and look at it and go, what does it take to get this car inside the shop? So a lot of us, that's where we first start addressing mobility. And if I've had to crash wrap it to protect the inside from water damage or whatever, to get it inside, I'm going to have to unwrap it. So that's something I've got to do for mobility. Now I've got to maybe install a wheel or something to get it rolling. And then I've got to cover up lines and make sure I'm not leaking while I'm rolling because the EPA is going to hold me accountable for every little drop <laughs> that makes it on the pavement. Um, and then once I get into the shop, I got to get an on and off racks or benches or lifts and I've got to push it around. So there's all this mobility labor. And when Larry and I visit shops, we sit there and we watch um, technicians wrestle cars inside. <laughs> and it's, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's somewhat entertaining for us in a way. <laughs> Or, you know, the poor porter has to go get two guys to help him. And then, you know, we're at some shops, they have forklifts. They're dragging these poor cars around in some ways. But that's a lot of labor that you guys are doing that you're not accounting for on the repair plan. So make sure there's compensation there. And, uh, you know, we add it up and it, it ends up being more than just a wheel, taking a wheel on and off. A lot of people think, oh, mobility is just a wheel. So keep that in mind. Uh, Larry, everyone wants to tell you that it's it's not December 2019, so it is time to flip that calendar on the wall. Uh, yes, well, the uh, calendar is stuck on that page because I'm waiting for my new calendar, and I haven't been able to get it yet because we're all under uh, quarantine, <laughs> and uh, there was an issue with the calendars I was getting, so I'm waiting for my new calendar to come, so no, I don't have it, but right. I do have, like, computerized versions of it, so. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say everyone that would like to send Larry a calendar, you may send them to Mid-Island Collision <laughs> <laughs> in New York. Care of Larry. And, uh, uh, that's uh, 468 Rockville Center, uh, uh, Lakeview, <laughs> Lakeview Avenue, uh, Rockville Center, New York. Uh, 11570. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going through here. Uh, Larry, what is the brand of that pinch weld dolly for frame rail replacement? Uh, I don't have a clue. I'd have to look it back up again. Okay. I found the picture online. I, I put in uh, um, vehicle dollies, and I think it's like the fourth picture in Google. And I think there is a website that links to where it is. Uh, um, a few of my clients already have them in the shop. I, I, I'm not positive the name of them and stuff. I, I, I do believe Select is one too that yep. works with uh, their Select bench. So if you have Select, you can get that. I don't think Carolina has their own uh, at all, but um, I mean, the Select one will work with any type bench system. So you can always order from that from Dave at Reliable or, or Select Direct, I think. So, Dave. Uh, Yes, uh, <laughs> Dave, my buddy Dave over there. You know um, what? Here's the thing: if we don't get to go to SEMA and then we don't get to do CIC, I'm not gonna get to see anybody. It's gonna be like I'm, I'm gonna have to go like a year without seeing Dave. All these well, people. maybe maybe we, well, I'm not too far from Dave. We can go over to Dave. I can bring my uh, my little tower thing here, and we can do a class right at Dave's shop. I, you know what? I think the future for us is gonna hold what basically like virtual trade shows, where it's like we go to these companies and broadcast you know no trade show booths anymore in a way so um but yeah uh Select does have does have one of those as well um lots of little things i i remember one time um and it was not at a body shop but we were working the salvage yard um and and you know every now and then as the insurer i would go out and i would do like the pope ride around of the salvage yard overseeing my glory of empire of inventory um, and I was watching them trying to get a vehicle ready to go through a version of the run and drive. And so to your point about being careful with airbags and disassembly and stuff, they were being a little too rough to try to get this car dragged over where it needed to be. And you just hear this pop sound and suddenly every <laughs> airbag in the car goes off. Yeah. That's um, a, that's a scary situation when you're trying to work on a car. I had a guy one time that had a airbag, uh, um, you know, sensor in the front because they were doing a um, rad support and they had them laid across the top of the engine off to the side. So they're kind of like hanging over the side of the front rail. So they're dangling around all over the place. And the guy drove in and out of the spray booth and he came back out of the spray booth all upset and his nose was bleeding because uh, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. Obviously, you're inside the shop. There's no reason to wear a seatbelt. And um, he's got a, a, his nose all bloody and stuff and his lips bloody. Well, the airbag deployed on him as he went over that bump getting inside the spray booth and the airbags deployed on him. So that was a, a, a $1,500 <laughs> mistake that uh, somebody decided to leave those dangling on there. So why don't you just unplug them? Well, yeah. we didn't get paid. And the best of was that the, the owner of the shop says, um, we didn't get paid for it. 
Oh, okay. So you didn't get paid for it. What would have, I mean, what would it have taken to unplug them? Point, point, you know, less than one, yeah. <laughs> you know, point zero, uh, uh, five, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just to go click on just two of them. But no, you decided that because your arrogance and your ignorance, it's going to cost you 1500 bucks or roll the dice. It's only happened yeah. once to you. Great. You proved the point and they deployed you under your watch. Your so now you owe them. So yeah, you're a that. smart guy. I'm not going to pay for that either. And uh, so now you're like a couple thousand dollars in airbags. Um, one of the, um, one of the comments, um, DGI fabrications has an amazing set of dollies. I have them here. Um, that's my combination of choice. I have DJI and I added the Goonie wheel about a year and a half ago. So I had the Goonie wheel before I ever did a video on them. Um, I love the Goonie wheel for going into the paint booth. Like you mentioned, Larry, it's, right. I have a ramp and it's, it's a whole lot easier for me that and, way. And, and I want to bring up, listen, the reason the Goonie wheel sucks, uh, according to a lot of people is because you over tighten it. Or you're That's leaving the off the washers. The washers are critical. I right. Yeah, yeah. You have to use the washer. Sometimes you need the backing plate, but you do have to torque them down. If you don't torque them down, you're going to destroy that wheel. You're going to cause damage to it, and it's going to suck. And then you go ahead and you try and run over five miles per hour because it's fun to have the wheel shake a little bit because <laughs> you, you're in the backyard like yeah. idiots. So stop playing around with people's cars. It, it's not a smart thing. Listen, I, we've all had dealers that we've dealt with with either a Dodge or, or, or a um, – a, a, a Chevy, you know, like with a Corvette or, or an SRT or a Demon or something like that, or a Hellcat, or even worse, like one of the Porsche or, 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 or uh, um, you know, Audi with the R8s dealership that the guy took it out or run around the corner that the tech, he had the test drive it and he goes ahead and he lets it go. And now he wrecked a, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar car because, you know, the car let loose on him and it was, yeah. it, it, it's a shame. Yeah. So, you know, don't, don't be screwed. It's going yeah. around with people's cars. One of the things to mention here is that, um, you know, and I'm, I was reading some posts this morning online in my daily you know, read through Facebook and try to stir up some drama because that's, you know, I don't, I don't have anything else to do right now. But <laughs> I, was, I was reading through where more and more comments are about how, you know, I can't believe the insurer was just here and they said they're not paying for this anymore, that they had, an, they had a meeting and now this is their new immediate policy to not pay. Um, there's a tendency when there's some sort of disaster or whatever in a market for shops to draw back and think that, you know, now's not the time to make changes. Um, but there's not a better time to make changes. And I think this is a great opportunity to, for a lot of people that have worried about charging all these non-included operations. Cause we, you know, we get, we get teased for it online, Larry. They're like, you guys just must not really want to fix a car. Everything's a total loss. Cause all these, you know, fees you add on there. I, I don't, I, I don't build my fix them. Yeah. There's a book that tells me how to fix them and I don't like to do anything for free. I you know, really don't, you know, you can, you can absolutely choose to do some stuff for free if you want to. We, you and I choose not to, we're, we like to, to, to make as much money yeah. as we possibly can on a repair. But if you choose, and to listen, I, you, free, know, you don't mind doing certain things for free, but when, when, when you actually prove to them how much they're doing for free, that there's actually times where you're doing more work for free than what you're actually charging to repair the car. It's like, well, how you make, this is why you can't make money. This is why you're behind the eight ball. Yeah. You know, this is why you can't pay your bills. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's so what it comes if down we think to. about it, it there, you can absolutely decide to do some things for free if you want to. That's, that's totally your, your call. But we now are in a situation where um, things that we used to always get paid for, that we had kind of taken for granted, we're now getting told no. And what I hope that this teaches shops in this teaching moment is that don't be afraid to ask for what it actually takes for those non-included operations. And then don't be afraid to push that charge to the customer if you need to, because, you know, it's, it's, you need to be profitable. And, and now is a great reason for why you need to be profitable. And I will say this in all of my time as a catastrophe manager, um, some, <laughs> there are a lot of charges on estimates that you guys are used to now. So like corrosion protection and hazardous waste that didn't used to be on estimates from insurance no. companies until this magic thing called a cat team came to town. <laughs> Um, and, and made the mistake of paying for some things and it changed the market. I used to love when I used to see corrosion protection on plastic bumper covers. <laughs> Look. It's like, oh no, we're told to pay for it. So we're just going to pay for corrosion protection. It's like, but, but Larry, we were just from, on a, a bumper cover. from a corporate perspective, Larry, we were just happy that we'd finally taught what corrosion protection was and they actually were adding it to the <laughs> estimate. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't feel that we were going to drill down that one, but, but it's a prime example of that in some of the, in some of the worst times is when some of the biggest changes in claims and claims handling are made. Um, and we're in here. So if the tendency right now is to draw back and go, I'm not going to ask for much and I'm not going to be a problem and I want to just get along because I want to survive. Now's a great time to be pushing for things that you're entitled to, things that you can show like Larry showed you in the P pages where it's definitely owed, um, where you can demonstrate why you have to do it. These are the times. Take advantage of it while you can. 
and you have the time and energy to direct to learning it. So, um, so Sergio joined us from Goonie Wheel. He's on there. I don't know if he's turned his that, camera yeah. on. Um, I don't, I don't know there if was in... another question on here, um, and we covered this last week. Uh, how do you guys feel about charging for cutting away blown airbags and cleaning up residue and total losses for mobility before the insurance decide that it is a total? Once again, you, you shouldn't cut any airbag uh, airbags apart. Uh, we talked last week about the uh, cleaning up of the airbag residue. You shouldn't get in that car until all the airbag stuff is cleaned up and you're wearing your protective clothing. So you can go back and watch that show as part of this uh, um, yeah. and never kneel or even get in the car until you clean the areas where you have to sit before you get in there and clean everything up. But you have to wear protective clothing. I do not recommend cutting airbag, you know, the airbag itself out and leaving the rest of the unit in there until the insurance companies look at it. So if you want to roll it up and kind of tape it on there, that's fine. But don't, uh, don't cut it. You're not supposed to do damage to it. Because a lot of times they're going to write the claim number and the date and take pictures of it so it's not reused again someplace else. Um, uh, um, somebody so, else brought up. Can we yeah. oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. There's another question we got on here. How do you explain yeah. that an operation takes more than one person if it doesn't specifically say that in the repair manual? Um, so the way we do that is is we actually write that on the line, like a, an explanation line with the labor. You know, two people or two texts required with the labor is. Um, and then it's a dialogue. If they call you or you're explaining that to the customer, you have to just say, here's why it takes two people. If you have a bill payer that's telling you, well, we're not paying for two people. Okay, that's interesting. I understand how you feel about that. Could you tell me how I might accomplish that with just the one person? I'd love to learn. Maybe you've seen something at some other shop I could learn from. Give them well, a chance to teach to pay it right. And, and if you read the repair manual, many of the repair managers will tell you an additional tech will be needed or use an additional tech for this. Right. Or in a dash, while one technician lowers X, the other technician will guide it into place. It'll actually say that in the repair manual. Yeah, so not in the estimating system, yeah. but in the repair manual. In the repair manual. That's, the, that's, that's your key is use the repair manual to be able to prove everything. And once again, if you don't have... Uh, uh, if it's if it's something in the database that's missing, well, then you have to go ahead and you have to send that complaint into the DEG. Yeah. And the DEG, D Danny does a great job of getting answers back from uh, the three manu uh, three database providers very well. Yeah, Somebody brought remember, up here. Oh, uh, uh, a negotiation tip. I think too often when an insurer tells you no about something, the ultimate reaction or the uh, the I, would, I want to say the average, but the anticipated reaction from an a shop is that you guys feel the need that you have to explain it, that I must thoroughly explain this to you in detail. That's not always an effective negotiation strategy. So sometimes the most effective strategy is to tell them, I, I'm very interested in that. Please explain to me how I might accomplish that. And I always use it. Maybe you've seen something somewhere that I haven't and I could learn from another shop because, you know, you get to go in and out of so many shops. And then it's like, I don't really know how to tell you how to do that differently, but you didn't set it up as an argument. And a lot of times that's a very effective way to argue why you need two technicians or you have to have a technician follow another tech to the dealership, or I have to have two cars on a test drive like Jason's been talking about lately. Um, it's not for you to explain. It's or two to techs ask. on a hybrid where one guy's got to watch the screen and the other guy's got to drive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, or if you're doing diagnostics, one guy's got to sit there with the computer while it's plugged into the uh, 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 DLC and one guy drives. Yep. And another guy's actually got to watch the screen and see how <clears throat> yeah. Oh, Larry was performing at that particular point in time. Just uh, know one of my favorite negotiation about, uh, techniques when... was to make the shop try to explain stuff to me that I thought they couldn't. So reverse that back and use that as a counter. Oh, yeah. Please explain it to me. <laughs> yeah. It looks like we're pretty good on questions here, Larry. Well, there's two more here I'd like to cover oh. real quick. Uh, when okay. can we bring back the golden oldie that's been missing since the common use of benches now? Rocker panel repair and refinish from using clamp type dollies. Um, well, you still have, even with, uh, with Carolina, uh, a lot of the uh, Asian vehicles and American vehicles will be clamped onto the, pa uh, onto the bench um, as opposed to select car bench or, or uh, global jig, which will not. Um, so, yeah, you'll, you'll, you would have to do some sort of repair from those clamp damages there if you're using uh, the dollies so yes you would have to take care of that uh in the case of like the europeans where you have the clamps like with the select uh, uh dolly system it actually goes into the cam lock system where the oval hole is for the jack mounts so that's not so bad hey, hey jason then, he, he just said european so i said european what's the problem <laughs> what are you guys laughing about we have a drinking game larry every time you say uh, european 
Yeah. Okay, and we made it almost an entire webinar without you saying European. You got close because you, you know, you had the Porsche mix up in the beginning and I was like, Oh, oh he's going to go there. Oh, okay. All right. I, I see where this is going for now. I'm waiting. <laughs> my next well, well uh, my next presentation watch what i say then uh oh. and then somebody else asked uh, um about the gunny wheel no you i said you do not use impact guns to no. torque the wheels on or torque sticks you use a torque wrench click click or a digital you do not use impact guns and never ever 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 use torque sticks torque <laughs> sticks are very very inaccurate and, um, and I'll give you the perfect example. How many people, uh, and you know, obviously not a show of hands here, but how many people have, you know, you, you're trying to get something off with a torque wrench, uh, you know, with a torque, with an impact gun, and it won't come off. And you go, hey, you know what, I'm, go get Jason's, you know, impact gun. That thing works great. It's got a lot of power. Well, my, my impact gun wasn't strong enough to break these, these nuts off, and yet Jason's is. Now, imagine if we go ahead and we put it to impact to put it on, and we're using the torque stick, Jason's going to twist that 90 foot pound torque stick differently than mine is and probably apply more pressure. So never use that. Make sure you use a torque wrench, uh, either a digital, which is extremely accurate or the old click type, the bar type you don't use at all. Okay. So just keep that in mind. So yes, you do have to talk the wheels on and uh, um, actually Sergio put up here, please order the, uh, the, the gunny washes as they are free. So order them. Okay. I don't know they why do. he's giving them away for free because anything for free, nobody wants. So they do you know, make he should, a big charge, him. Yeah, he should really... charge from, I would charge three times the price of the wheel. Let, well, me, a... Sergio, let me start doing your, uh, let me just start doing your marketing for you. Yeah. All right. You, the, uh, the, the, the wheels Tuesday. are 50 bucks and the washes are $4,000 each. I'll make you a lot of money with this. <laughs> you hired. Tuesday, I come and see you. So... Well, welcome on board. <laughs> I don't know. If you give them away for free, nobody seems to use them, I, you know. <laughs> oh, well, there's the deal. I mean, that's just a uh, you know, good guy, small company, uh, entrepreneur. Um, Sergio, are you in Atlanta today or are you just somewhere else? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in Atlanta today. Okay. I'm stuck right. in Atlanta. You're Atlanta, stuck in yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. Well, we're, yeah, can't go anywhere. Yeah. We're glad you're here and not outside the country because in our opinion, you're safer here, but we're a little biased. Oh, yeah. So that's awesome. <laughs> good to be here. So, yeah, but a small, you know, a startup company and, you know, he's doing big things and he's got LKQ distributing and everything for him now, but here he is still giving stuff away, just hoping people use his product right, which is, which is what I like. So, um, but I did learn somewhat the hard way before Sergio came to visit and do a class with me and everything that those washers are critical. So um, make sure you get them. In All the instructions. I'm sure Sergio has an instruction booklet, a manual that tells you how to put the wheel on, <laughs> how to put the washers on and tells you what to talk it on. That's correct. And you know what? This 30 year bullshit that people give you can't be true. Cause he only came out with the wheel last year. So 30 years <laughs> experience means nothing. Yeah. The thing came out last year. You know, and just one more thing, you know, and the spacer goes at the back of the wheel, not the front of the wheel as a, as a washer guy. Right. That's, that's become a, you know, we, we're getting a couple of videos on that. And, uh, you know, obviously the space is to, to help you, you know, get some extra offset for the bigger brake calipers, you know, and some of the guys are trying to use it as washers, but they're obviously going to break off. Uh, the washers are stainless steel, much more durable. The reason I've done it for free, you know, it's, you know, it's, I couldn't make the wheel any thicker. Also, it would be just too heavy to handle. So, you know, I brought the washers out, um, you know, I've manufactured just over 200,000 washers now, and uh, I'm sending them out to all the customers pre-ordered or already, uh, you know, ordering going forward. So if you guys have ordered any wheels and don't have washers, just reach out to us and we'll make sure you guys get your washers. Uh, it's, a, it's a great product. I keep, I think I've got three of the small and one of the, one of the big SUV styles here, but um, it makes getting in and out of the paint booth a breeze and driving around. So awesome. All right, Larry, we are, uh, we are out for the day. So one okay. webinar today, and then we pick All up right. the two a day starting tomorrow. Um, and then when are you back? What am I back where? where? Down by oh, you? your next webinar. When's your next webinar? Oh, my, ne what, my next webinar, I believe, is in two weeks. And I think we're going to try and jam in one next week, you said. Okay. I'm going to plan on trying to get something in there because I can't travel to the week of the 13th. But the next one is the 21st. And this is about estimating emblems and nameplates uh, on vehicles. And um, I actually have a, um, an update to the old challenge I did. Uh, you got to write more than 500 bucks to put on uh, emblems on a Toyota Camry 
on the rear trunk lid, uh, the clue was, or the hint was, was a black car. So now I'm going to have, um, I'm going to have the uh, uh, updated version of that on a new uh, 2019 and I have a whole bunch of procedures for a bunch of different manufacturers we're going to go over and um, I'm actually talking with the P pages with, with uh, Danny from the P pages uh, the DEG to try and um, make sure I have everything clarified exactly the way it's supposed to be so that uh, I can get everyone the right information. Ah. Well, thanks. Hey, Jason, thanks for popping up that video up there in the chat session. But if you want to go hey, watch bet. the cool tools that we did on the Goonie wheel, um, you can definitely go watch that. And then somebody popped up the link to the installation instructions so we can all go read those on our break. Wait, 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 wait. Installation instructions. Wait a second. Uh, what? I'm, and I'm sure that, I'm sure this ex Sergio has an exploded view of the hub, the, the, the spacer, then the wheel, and then the washes, and then the nuts. Think, and then down there is probably a big red thing think, that says, you know, only, only, only tighten to 50 foot pounds. You, but nobody have, reads it. Have you ordered your, your wheel yet? Who? Have you ordered your Goonie wheel yet? No, 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 no. I'm okay. waiting for uh, the, the little tech who chases park bus to come I'm gonna, back. I'm going to ship you one because I just really want to see you do your own installation series or your own how to <laughs> video. I just, I just want that shot. If you can get As, as I have the instructions camera. out and I'm reading them. Yeah, that would be, that would be awesome. So, well, all right. He, well, he, Larry, he we needs will... to report to work on Monday, so I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> Every I'm shop in I can't refuse. Every shop in New York will have one, even if they don't have cars. They will have a wheel by the time he's done with them. So it'll be, it'll be awesome. So, but yeah, we are going to add some extra stuff. So for those of y'all that have, that have stayed, next week, uh, Larry and Jason were supposed to be here. And we had some live virtual classes we were going to be teaching um, while we were recording the new estimating series. And while Larry is, I, I guess the whole state of New York is quarantined. <laughs> no one's allowed uh, out. Yeah, for right now. So I don't think yeah. I'll be down there till May. So we're going to have to push that back to May. And we'll do yeah. well, some classes then and some filming. But, so uh, it's uh, Larry's trapped and uh, Jason is eventually still coming, but we're going to delay a little bit while we're in this apex. And then I think he's with me. We're not going to fly anymore this year. We're all going to be driving everywhere we go. So <laughs> um, trying to avoid some airports. So um, uh, we are looking drive for me coming from uh, New York. Yeah, I'm going to still do the conversations class next week, but we got to figure out what we're going to do on the post repair inspection class. So we'll be putting our heads together. All right, everybody have a fantastic day and we'll see everyone tomorrow up. Um, tomorrow it is a double header. Um, so I'm going to jump back over there. 11 a.m. with uh, Jason Sharton and Mike Anderson, shop accounting. Yeah, we're going to do body shop accounting with 3M and go over the crimp tool. And so we'll have Mike Anderson um, up with 3M to talk about that. It's something he requires for all of his shops. So he's going to talk about um, using it as a management tool while Jason from 3M talks us through the tool. Um, and then at two o'clock, I'll be up with the new estimator roles. So what are the, what's the new job description for an estimator look like? And we'll kind of go over that and we'll talk about how to train your estimators if you're getting new ones in. So big day tomorrow. I should make a presentation. <laughs> All right, guys, have a fantastic day. Take Bye -bye. care.